Please welcome to the stage Dean of the University of Colorado School of Education, Kathy Schultz. Good afternoon. I don't usually get music when I get welcome to a stage. Um, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to, to um, welcome you to this panel, which is called The Role of Education in Building a Global Culture of Knowledge and Inquiry about Climate Change, Its Human Rights Impacts, and Solutions. And a warm welcome to those of you online as well as those of you in the audience. As you heard, I'm Kathy Schultz, Dean of the School of Education here at CU Boulder. And it's really my pleasure to welcome you to this panel, which we know will be thought-provoking, powerful, and important. The panel will discuss the responsibilities and roles of educational systems from primary to higher education in building both a global and local culture of knowledge an investigation about climate change, its human rights impacts and solutions. The basis of this discussion is the universal human right to education and the importance for educational systems to promote a respect for the natural world, the range of global cultures, and traditional forms of knowledge. We know that education is key to make critical and necessary changes in the US and across the globe to address both climate change and human rights issues. While the responsibility for these changes cannot and should not rest solely on educators, this is a starting place and, and understanding how to support educators in this important mission is critical to the survivor, survival of our planet and our ability to thrive as humans. So a little bit about our School of Education. We're one of the top schools of education in the country, and the mission of our school is grounded in a lived commitment to democracy, diversity, equity, and justice. We teach and engage in research with our colleagues in schools and communities to make a transformative difference. The work of our faculty, researchers, staff, and students contribute to evidence-based policy and practice. And we aim for our graduates to be engaged and informed educators researchers, policymakers, and community leaders. We have many different programs in our school, including nationally recognized programs to prepare future teachers. So our School of Education is dedicated to preparing teachers to advance educational equity and social justice. Teacher candidates explore instructional methods specific to their cont content areas, examine the social foundations of education, and learn specific strategies to meet all students' needs in today's classrooms. And this means that we prepare them to address issues such as climate change and human rights. And in particular, our science methods classes introduce students to ways to address climate change in a range of K-12 classrooms, giving students language for teaching important concepts in location where there may be censorship around issues such as the intersection of climate change and human rights. We practice with our students so they feel confident to teach and stand behind curriculum that addresses key local and global issues. In Boulder, a group of retired teachers and community members started a nonprofit group called Classrooms for Climate Action, who work closely with local elementary schools and teachers to support children's interests in learning about climate change and taking action. They've been part of a statewide advocacy for electric school buses, remediation of invasive plants that fuel wildfire is an important topic in our um, area, and public service communication about waters, lands, and air that we share. Dr. Melissa Broughton from the CU Boulder School of Education, our, our School of Education, and Dr. Jessica Bean from the University of California, Berkeley, are capturing what, climates for, cli what Classrooms for Climate Action does and creating a toolkit to help others around the country and around the world in this kind of work in their own local communities. We live in complex and challenging times, and we are continually striving as a school of education to stand together with our wonderfully diverse community, teach for equity and justice, create safe and affirming spaces, and serve as a resource for and partner to our university, school, teachers, alumni, policymakers, and community at large. 
Now it is my pleasure to introduce Megan O'Toole, the moderator of this afternoon's panel. Megan O'Toole is an award-winning investigative and data journalist with a career spanning two decades. She's reported from more than a dozen countries and topics that include the war on the ISIS, the Gaza siege, the economic impact of US sanctions on, on Iran, and the refugee crisis along the Mediterranean. An editor for the Middle East Eye, she has served as a reporter and editor for several outlets, including Al Jazeera and The Globe and Mail. As an international editor, she has managed dozens of journalists throughout the Middle East and North Africa, commissioning and editing stories from across the region. She's also a member of Bellingcat's Global Authentic Authentication, <laughs> Authentication Project, contributing to an open source investigation of potential war, war crimes in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. O'Toole's work has won a variety of accolades, including two awards from Amnesty International for her coverage of indigenous land rights and environmental justice. She was part of the largest collaborative investigation in Canadian journal, journalism history, Tainted Water, a prize-winning series that exposed unsafe levels of lead in drinking water and spurred government action from coast to coast. In the Data Journalism Handbook, her project on Israeli home demolitions in East Jerusalem was featured as an exemplar. A Pulitzer Center grantee, O'Toole is also a global mentor with the Coalition for Women in Journalism and has served as a judge for the Online Journalism Awards. Please join me in welcoming Megan. Thanks so much, Kathy, and thanks everyone for being here today. We have a fantastic panel, and I think it's going to be a really interesting discussion. Uh, to get started, I'd like to introduce our four panelists. First up, Eli Nadia Zulfikar. Nadia is the chair and program director of the climate justice and feminist organization Klima Action Malaysia, led by young people to mobilize a climate emergency declaration in Malaysia. Kami's foundation lies in nurturing meaningful partnerships, grassroots empowerment, peace building, and strengthening constituencies for a just and peaceful transition of society. Nadia is also a climate policy consultant and risk advisor with experience in several local think tanks and international institutions, such as the Institute of Strategic and International Studies Malaysia, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, European Climate Foundation, Climate Tracker, Stanley Center for Peace and Security, the Inca Group's Young Leaders Board, and the Swedish Foreign Ministry's International Advisory Group for the Environment, Climate, and Biodiversity. Uh, Nadia, would you like to come up now? And as Nadia is getting settled, I'll introduce our next panelist, Gitanjali Rao. Gitanjali was recognized as the United States' top young scientist and received an EPA presidential award for inventing her device, Tethys, a tool for early detection of lead. This adds to her collection of inventions, including Epione, a device for early diagnosis of prescription opioid addiction using genetic engineering, and Kindly, an anti-cyberbullying service using AI and natural language processing. She was honored as one of Forbes' 30 under 30 in science in 2019, and Time's top young innovator and Time Kid of the Year for her innovations and STEM workshops, which she conducts globally, inspiring more than 60,000 students in 40 countries across six continents. Gitanjali is the author of the book Young Innovator's Guide to STEM, available in five languages, which guides students and educators through a five-step innovation process. She was honored as one of the US top youth volunteers by Prudential in 2021 and was appointed UNICEF Youth Advocate for using science to solve social problems such as cyberbullying and developing solutions for environmental protection. She recently received a grant as a National Geographic Young Explorer to expand her workshops. Gitanjali, would you like to join us up here? Now our next panelist, Jono Anzalone, is actually joining us via video link from Hanoi. Do we, do we have that link up? Well, we'll get it up in any event. Jono is the executive director of the Climate Initiative, 
Uh, here we go. Hi, Jono. Uh, a nonpartisan organization that aims to inspire, educate, and empower 10 million youth around climate action by 2025. He joined TCI after a long tenure at the Red Cross, where he started as a youth volunteer in 1994 in Omaha, Nebraska. Most recently, Jono served as the head of disaster and crisis preparedness, response and recovery for the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies for the Americas and Caribbean region, based in Panama. He also served as the vice president of international services at the American Red Cross based out of Washington, DC. Jono's hundreds of national and international disaster assignments have led him to serve in places such as Mexico, Belize, Suriname, Jamaica, the Bahamas, Turks and Caicos, Liberia, and Haiti, where he aided the US Agency on International Development after the, 2020, the 2010 earthquake and led donation management activity. Jono also served as the advocacy uh, committee chair for the National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster from 2012 to 2015, and is the vice chair of the Craft Emergency Relief Fund. Hi, Jono, glad you could join us. And now our fourth panelist actually is not able to join us today, but Pasang Dolma Sherpa. Uh, we're going to hear her thoughts momentarily, but first I'd still like to introduce her. Uh, Pasang Dolma Sherpa, Executive Director of the Center for Indigenous Peoples Research and Development, has worked with Indigenous peoples, women, and local communities for the recognition of Indigenous knowledge, cultural values, and customary institutions that have contributed to sustainable management of forests, ecosystems, biodiversity, and climate resilience for more than a decade. Her work focuses on climate issues for Sherpas in the Himalayas, as well as global policy work on loss and damage. Pasang has served multiple organizations, including as the co-chair of the International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change and co-chair of the facilitative working group of local communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. She is currently the chair of the Specialist Group on Indigenous Peoples, Customary and Environmental Laws and Human Rights within the IUCN's Commission on Environmental, Economic and Social Policy, and is a visiting faculty member at Kathmandu University. So Pasang has sent a video statement in which she discusses the vital role of Indigenous knowledge in the uh, battle against climate change, and we can play that now. Kashibile, uh, namaskar, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, uh, joining both in person and virtually. My name is Pasang Dolma Serpa. Uh, uh, I work for Center for Indigenous Peoples uh, Research and Development uh, based in uh, Kathmandu, Nepal. Wonderful uh, to be part of this panel among distinguished panelists. Uh, thank you so much for your invitation. My apology, I could not make in person, but thankful uh, that at least I could join virtually. The role of education uh, is pertinent in the discourse of climate change for healthy environment, for all of us to live in peace and harmony with nature. However, uh, the present trend of modern education uh, system that we have been brought up with has a hardly space for indigenous knowledge and cultural values that has symbiotic relation with the nature and contribution for climate change resilience. Consequently, we are inviting more unsustainable future. I would like to begin with an example from my childhood. I was sent to a small primary school in a village called Chuhade in Nepal, like many other schools around the world, where indigenous values and culture and practices, language, even the name were not welcome. My teacher changed my name into Kanchi Maya when I was six years old for the first time when I was admitted at school. I stick to the name almost for six years until my sister brought me back to Kathmandu for my higher schooling. When I was able to, when my sister was able to, you know, um, stick to my original name, Pasang Dolma Serpa, as given to me by my father. The story looks simple. But working with indigenous communities in Nepal, Asia, and around the world for more than 17 years now, I have heard the similar experience and stories of indigenous people, how they have struggled with their names, with their language, with their practices at school, and even at the working space. 
the tragedy of losing language, culture, knowledge, skills among the indigenous peoples, even not been felt, even not been realized, because our young generation are put in illusion of the fantasy of sand discoveries and meeting the increasing demand of the market employment opportunities, where no space for indigenous knowledge, cultural values, and practices for us to live with respect and dignity. This is actually one of the, one of the impacts of the violation of fundamental human rights of indigenous people to protect, promote, and continue our knowledge, our language, our values, our practices that has been enshrined by UN DRIP, even ILO Convention 169. The concept of postmodern has been helpful for us to reflect back, question back, are you okay to move ahead with the existing education system and development approach? Or we need to think differently. The study carried out by ILO and IPBS 2019 shows how 6.2% of indigenous people's world population contributing in safeguarding more than 80% of the biodiversity of the whole world. Our own experience and the ground reality and the outcome of the different study carried out by Indigenous Peoples Organization already shows the crucial role played by Indigenous Peoples, especially our customer institution, our governance system for the protection of the biodiversity ecosystem and intact of the natural resources. For example, the Sakya is one of the customer institutions of indigenous peoples in the mountain region of Nepal, based on the Buddhism non-violence violence principle, killing both domestic and wild animals, chopping down green trees, harvesting wild honey, Place trading, forest fire in the community forestry are completely forbidden. These culture and values are the basis for the protection of the biodiversity, natural resources, and intact of the natural resources and the forest. However, in the absence of the recognition, promotion, protection of our customer institution, our practices by the existing forest regime and development process, Along with the disappearance of the customer institution and governance system, indigenous knowledge, cultural values has also been disappearing. And along with the disappearance of the biodiversity and natural resources and difficult to deal with the climate crisis and, pest, and also the global crisis we have been facing. Although there has been continuous struggle of indigenous people at the global level in the UN Forum since 2019 to 92, only in the two decades of the struggle of our elders in the UN C, only in Paris Agreement, COP21 in 2015 in Paris, along with the establishment of the platform of the local communities and indigenous peoples, started indigenous peoples stories and experiences being heard by the state parties negotiators different bodies inside and outside the UN C. 2019 started being in function along with the establishment of the facility working group of local communities and indigenous peoples platform and with the equal representative of indigenous peoples and the state parties out of 14 members from seven sociocultural regions to discuss on three mandate of the platform, knowledge, capacity building, climate policy and action. Out of 12 activities in the first initial three years, where I was also working as a representative of indigenous people from Asia, Later, I became the first co-chair of the platform of UNCCC. We really try to develop the space, how indigenous knowledge is important. One of the activities of the knowledge, for, knowledge function has been an indigenous education curriculum. We started working with 
is action climate empowerment within the UN C, as well as collaborating with the different university institution bodies who have been working on the climate change and indigenous peoples, and especially starting with the indigenous study program and educating to the young generation. One of the examples out of my own engagements in the UN C on the indigenous education curricula is also implication at Kathmandu University, where I have been teaching as a visiting faculty member, and we are putting our efforts to implement indigenous study program from August 2023, exchanging our knowledge and experience with other constituent, constituents, bodies, as well as institution, university around the world. And we also seek your support and collaboration to make it happen. And this will give the opportunity for our young generation in Asia and also around the world exchange of our experience to value the indigenous knowledge, skills, practices among young generation to live with respect and dignity and continuation of our symbiotic relation with nature for our sustainable future to live in peace, harmony with nature and communities at community level, at national level, and the global level. Thank you very much. And if you have any queries, please get back to me through email or WhatsApp. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. So thanks so much again to Pasang for sending through that statement. I know we did all want to hear from her, and that's fantastic that we were able to do so. And as she mentioned, if anyone does want to get in touch, uh, let us know. We can coordinate that by putting you in touch with her via email. Um, and I think some of the themes she mentioned are going to come up as well in our discussion today. So um, before we get going, I wanted to mention again that uh, anyone in the audience, either virtually or here in person, who does want to submit a question can do so through the Attendee Hub app. And towards the end, we will uh, try to address some of those questions. So to begin, we're seeing globally a lack of action on climate change, despite its negative effects, particularly on disadvantaged communities around the world. I wanted to ask our panelists, to what extent do you believe this is related or a result of a general lack of knowledge, both around climate change and its human rights impacts? And Nadia, if you wanted to start us off on that one. All right. Um, hello. <laughs> testing, testing. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, uh, thanks so much for the CU, CU Boulder and the UN Human Rights and the different partners who um, invited me to come to this uh, summit. Um, I have to say I almost never took the flight out from Kuala Lumpur to come here because it was very tiring. Um, I was, I was in Stockholm and then um, I was traveling around learning about human rights learning about um, you know, how, how to get you know, uh, the different programs that we are running under our organization funding and things like that. So it, it requires a lot of work on my end as an, as an activist from the Global South to actually go out and seek those kind of you know, uh, knowledge, uh, partnership, strategies, and all those kind of stuff. So um, truth to be told, I. Uh, I didn't learn about human rights in a class. I, I learned about human rights on the streets. So um, in 2019, I was in my second year at the university, and um, it, was, you know, it was in 2018, so the IPCC report came out, the 1.5 report came out, and my professor gave us an assignment, why don't you guys you know, um, try to, to read out and, and try to give a summary of what it's all about. And that somehow spurred the kind of, you know, felt of, um, I, I felt really helpless. I felt really helpless. So the, the, the work that, that I do come from, from that end, you know, helplessness and anger and fear. Um, so the first thing that I did after that report came out was I 
seek out um, friends um, who's, who's not doing climate work. None of them were doing climate work, but they were all working in human rights um, landscape in Malaysia, either in, in, in um, other social justice movements or gender justice movements. So I started to do climate protests. We, we went down the streets and start doing protests. So that's the first time that Malaysia has had climate protests. That's where I learned about human rights. For example, the rights to information, the rights to protest, the right to voice out. And of course, what happens after that, how to deal with police and authorities and how to hire lawyers and et cetera, how to defend yourself in an, in inter, in, in, in an interview at the police station. So I learned all that <laughs> just by doing protests on the streets. I didn't learn that at, 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 at my class in, in, in university. So it started from there. So, um, so whether the question, to answer the question whether I believe it or not, is, is, is I've moved beyond that. So my work right now revolves around understanding of why <clears throat> that is happening, why um, there's a general lack of knowledge around both climate change and human rights impacts really um, you know, constricts the way how we, you know, cover how we do advocacy in climate, especially climate action in, in the global south. So at the moment, um, I am the uh, environment lead of the uh, National Baseline Assessment of Business and Human Rights for the National Action Plan in Malaysia. I was given the opportunity, I was given the trust by the Malaysian Human Rights Commission to grant this. And in my consultation, so when I asked all the civil societies, policymakers, and businesses whether they do they understand what human rights are, um, most of them couldn't find a clear linkage between climate change, uh, climate crisis, and, and and of course human rights. So I try, you know, dig deeper and find out what has happened. So in the past few decades, the story of climate has always been told from a very scientific. Um, um, narrative, right? So it has, it has always been told by people who has a background in science. Um, it has always been told by graphs, emission, projections, uh, percentage, modeling, ArcGIS, who does ArcGIS here. So real respect <laughs> on you and not <laughs> dissing you off, but, but that's what happens. You know, people can't see the human face from these graphs. You can't see death. You can't see the, um, you know, the uh, mortality or morbidity that people are experiencing you know, the, over the past decades. So this kind of education system that we have in Malaysia has really put um, you know, uh, people into boxes. Right? For example, if you're studying science, you can talk uh, as much as you want about climate. If you're from the business, uh, uh, community, so you can talk about climate and the technicalities, but if you're coming from an art major or gender rights or other social movements, you're not encouraged to contribute in that climate dialogues. So intersectionality is taboo. It's, it's something, it's the biggest challenge that our education system, and it constricts and limits creativity. So in my work, just another example, um, my, our organization is the first organization in Malaysia that lobbies for gender advocacy at the national uh, level and parliamentary level on climate action. So one of our objectives is definitely to, to, um, to get to appoint a national gender focal point for climate. And to do that, I have to get through to all the different women's group in Malaysia. And when I started mapping um, the, what are the biggest challenges of them not um, making into, um, you know, not, not participating in decision making on climate, say national adaptation plan, all these different policy uh, consultations. And they say that climate issues should be taken up by people who have a science background. Just that. Imagine they are already, you know, they are already experiencing the lived realities. They are already doing, doing some of the solutions on the ground, but yet they think that the kind of discussion should be taken by people from a science background. And that is such a sad thing. I, I kept thinking, why? Why this is happening? So we started to do a lot of capacity building in that, and you know, we use a lot of art to tell uh, live realities of people. So in 20, hang on, in 2021, so we started to use art and documentary um, to, to tell the story of indigenous people in Malaysia. Um, 
in COP in, in Glasgow at that time. So that's the first time there was actually a voice of indigenous people from Peninsular Malaysia in UNFCCC, 26 years of you know, existence and process. So it was a huge undertaking and, and it, it was all being um, spearheaded by indigenous young women in Peninsular Malaysia. And of course, it, it gives a lot of uh, power to us because when we were there, we kind of have a, a, a power to shift narratives through this art and documentary. We, 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 we brought accountability to the Malaysian government who was acting like a human rights leader at the Human Rights Council. Um, but in fact, they are not. So we, we try to bring more of those stories that have been silenced. We try to bring more visibility to all those kind of stories. And the other part that um, we are also working with uh, on, on at that moment, we worked on climate journalism, on energy transition. So we try to battle disinformation and misinformation. It's everywhere. If you have social media, you see all sorts of different information on, on climate, very polarized. So with that, we try to strengthen the rights to information, data accessibility, and of course, to socialize the word climate justice and climate emergency. So these are some of the activities that we do on the ground to, to bring in more information on climate to the people. So I hope. That's that great. Ends. Yeah, thank you so much, Nadia. And uh, to bring in Gitanjali, I wonder if you could comment as well on what role um, education systems should play when it comes to building up this knowledge base, as well as whether the lack of action is, uh, to what extent is related to a knowledge gap? Yeah, um, absolutely. First of all, good mor it's not morning. I'm the, <laughs> the only person on the stage that it's from the United States and I'm still disoriented. Um, <laughs> but um, it's great to be here. It's an honor to be here, honestly. Um, and yeah, I think to answer the question in short terms, um, most, if not all of the you know, anybody who doubts climate change comes from that lack of knowledge that you see out there. The best way to solve that is by just answering questions, right? But now the hard part comes from in what form do you just answer those questions? And I think the biggest hump that we need to get over is when things that are blatantly scientific knowledge tend to be politicized, right? Um, and we see these things like even during the whole, well, we are in the middle of COVID, but especially during the peak of that entire pandemic, we saw so many different things that were just basic human rights and basic health turn into something that was just a debate for no reason. And I think that's slowly what climate change has been becoming over the years and it's becoming really sad to kind of watch it all go down because climate change is something that is so obvious in society, something that's happening on a daily basis, but there are going to be those people who say they don't exist. Not for it doesn't exist, not because they don't want to recognize it out there, but because they don't have those questions answered. And now going to kind of your point about the education system, what we can do, I think the biggest thing to first address is that we have made progress and we've come a long way, right? And I don't live in Malaysia, I live in the United States, I live in Colorado, right? And within our school system, we learn a lot about climate change. We learn a lot about human rights. And I think it has been increasing over the years and it's become <coughs> incredibly important as something that's you know, not just for a specific area of people to kind of recognize and take up. But I think a lot of our education system also lies around this idea of, okay, can we scare you enough to the fact that you have to do something about this mm -hmm. or you have to take that next step? But instead kind of, I guess, coaxing these students in the best way possible to go out there, do something, um, kind of put it out there in whatever way, shape, or form that they recognize. And I really like the point that you said about you know, not limiting it all to a science background. And obviously this sounds like a hypocrite, because <laughs> hello. Um, but I think most of it is also recognizing that a lot of the best changes come from a combination of a variety of different fields and a multidisciplinary approach. And as with any other problem that we're gonna see out there, climate change is one of those things that we're going to have to tackle with the multidisciplinary approach, regardless of how long that takes. So yeah, that's kind of my perspective on it. Absolutely, yeah, great points. And Jono, uh, we wanted to bring you to the discussion as well, if you had any thoughts on that. Definitely. Thanks for allowing me to join from Pinoy. It's great to be on the virtual stage with such a distinguished panel. And again, thanks to the university, to you, Megan, for facilitating and just raising awareness around this issue. Um, the one thing I would, I would compliment or, or add is really that need for intersectionality. I think so much of the data sets around how we have for decades struggled with teaching around the risks around climate science 
in using very much a data analytics perspective, a STEM perspective, is really nicely emphasized by my colleagues on the stage around the need for intersectionality. And in particular, kind of marrying this beautiful body of awareness around human rights where we continue to see across the globe communities, especially those most impacted by climate change, recognizing the real um, need for systems and structures to protect basic human dignity and marrying that with this universal right to education um, and the way in which we do that. So I think we've, we have come a long way. I get excited about thinking about this next generation of youth. Um, we work with 13 to 23 year olds at the Climate Initiative and there's so much energy and passion to really change or undo many of the, I think, systematic issues that we know are going to be um, quite pervasive. Um, the last thing I would say, just in terms of this relationship between human rights and climate change, is really where in systems being created, both at the national nation state level as well as at the community level, is while data has been ineffective in really raising um, or uh, voicing the concerns and taking bolder action across systems, I still think it's an important driver for some of the key decisions that policymakers have an opportunity to correct. Um, an example, just last month, the New York Times talked about in the United States context, how just um, two hours a year is being spent talking about climate science in classrooms across the United States. And I think to Yichanjali's point is that there is so much polarization in communities across the United States. I'm here in Vietnam for a month long period working with students. And there's such an openness that really comes from indigenous perspectives in Vietnam, 54 indigenous uh, distinct community identities in Vietnam, and really thinking about ways to protect the earth while still enjoying a quality of life that comes with market growth. Um, so this blending of ideologies, this blending of cultural identities, I think is a, a really beautiful opportunity for policymakers to really think about how uh, curricula can be adapted in ways that um, leverage data, certainly from uh, the sciences, but also bring in so many of the beautiful pieces from arts and humanities, as my other colleagues stated on the panel. Great. And outside of formal education systems, um, I also want to talk a little bit about the importance of getting individuals to view themselves as problem solvers and change agents. And I know you each have unique experiences on that front. So, Johnny, you actually just mentioned the Climate Initiative. So I wanted to start with you on this one. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how your work there has brought people together to learn about climate change, but also how they can make a difference? Absolutely. I think for, for our perspective, we were very intentional about looking at 13 to 23 year olds, recognizing the grave crisis that climate change really presents for the future, and really recognizing that 13 year olds are gonna be very quickly in decision making roles, not only around the education and their career paths, but really around the systems in which they live. Um, and that, that voice to really feel uh, empowered, um, especially those that have traditionally uh, not had a seat at the table to really present their unique perspectives and lived experiences. Um, so we have a very basic model, which is to empower youth voices for climate action across the globe. Um, while we are 19 full-time staff within the United States, it became very quick um, to scale globally and youth from across the globe um, really are looking for platforms to feel like they have agency and can make a change. And an example, two examples I'd like to give, um, really one where we started in the small little state of Maine up in the Northeast is really having youth that were working with legislators and the governor to create a non-binding climate education bill. Uh, why non-binding? Because there was such a divide even within a very progressive state house around the implications of a climate education bill being mandatory um, and the crowded curricula that so many educational institutions face around the globe um, that they really wanted to create an incentive-based system so that educators in very rural parts of the state and very populated parts of the state could tap into resources that allow them to close that gap between the 84% of teachers across the globe that wanna teach climate science 
and yet only 43% do. So really looking at ways to systematize using the legislative process um, was, is one example. And the other one that I was really quite pleased with is just two months ago, when the Inflation Reduction Act passed, historic legislation in the United States to really jumpstart green investing and systems changes that are needed to correct the US's part in the global climate, climate crisis. I read an amazing article from Tom Steyer who wrote a contributing article on the Hill, um, in the Hill publication. And the article said, we can thank youth for passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. And the skeptical me read the headline and was very curious in terms of why uh, Tom Steyer believed that young people, many of them who um, were just uh, starting their, their part in civil society as voting eligible citizens, um, really contributed to the passage of this monumental legislation. And Tom did a beautiful job in the way that he does in really presenting the fact that youth this is one of the most existential threats and concerns that youth have. Um, and we've already heard from one of uh, our distinguished panelists that this sense of anxiety um, and hopelessness is not unique um, to students in the United States. It is a global phenomena that is now being studied by psychologists across the globe. And as a result, taking the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and the Climate Initiative, really theory of change, which is empowering youth with the agency to feel like their voices can be heard. And case in point with the Inflation Reduction Act, we saw a record number of 18 year old first time youth that were voting, which in, in you know, real short term um, made a huge impact in passage of really milestone legislation. And I'm seeing this in communities across the globe, not just in the United States. Um, here in, in Vietnam, there's an incredible amount of Gen Zs that are wanting to feel like their voice is being heard in a very different uh, ecosystem in terms of political context. And in many ways, uh, a more agile uh, methodology using uh, the structures which are in place in places like Vietnam or more centralized economies. Um, so I think that the, the basics of a theory of change which talk about empowering youth voices for climate action is really taking that to the next step and really um, in particular, youth that have traditionally been underrepresented, the Global South, in the United States, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and really uh, leveraging those youth voices, I believe, is going to be a secret tool in really blending this combination of um, attacking climate change, as we know it is an existential threat, and then, as we're discussing today, this intersection with human rights and human dignity. That's great, really important work. And I can pivot here to Nadia as well. Um, if you could tell us a little more about your organization, Klima Action Malaysia. Um, how does that encourage people to get together and kind of push for global climate action? Um, so I think I already started about the story that we, we started off by doing protests on the ground and um, the kind of learning that we get from the, from the streets are completely different than what we learn um, at our university and at schools. And then again, um, the, it's not the encouragement, it's, it's just basically we are trying to survive. Um, in, um, in 2021, last year, uh, Malaysia suffered one of the worst um, uh, floods uh, that we have seen in recent memory. Uh, several dozens of people were murdered and um, we suffered around 8 billion um, USC dollar, or was it Malaysian ringgit, of loss in, in properties and, and damages. So it, was, it, wasn't, it didn't come from a space to, to encourage, but it's just people stepped up because they have to survive. So uh, at that time, I remember that uh, when that happened, um, we all suddenly became, um, you know, agents of change. We went down to, uh, um, and, and, and buy kayaks and we travel all around and trying to bring food to communities who were affected, who didn't get help from the government and etc. So it, it started from there. So I just wanted to, to, to share that um, by doing that, by, by um, you know, taking initiative by your own, you kind of shift the paradigm that you need to constantly um, depend on government. I mean, it's important to hold the, gov the government account to, uh, to account, but it's also really important to, um, 
to, to challenge that dependency that you, you are getting from the government. This is extremely critical because at this moment we see that the, uh, the governments are moving slower than the climate impacts that frontline committees, people like me already seeing on the ground and what happens in COP, <laughs> 26 years of um, negotiations have seen emissions skyrocketing 60%, if I'm not mis being mistaken, what Mary uh, just mentioned previously in her keynote speech. So it's, it's very problematic. So um, we, the way where we, again, I try to avoid <laughs> use the word encouragement, but we do a lot of capacity building. And one of the kind of education that we were um, really the, investing in is community empowerment. So it's extremely important because um, it's key to implementation, and, and let's not, um, you know, uh, um, we have to think that um, people people need, sorry, people need to understand what their rights are. So implementation, for example, is an extremely social process, right? So where people come in and then they implement things on the ground and etc. because we understand that there is no silver bullet, not one solution fits all, right? And then with that, um, young women who, was who, who are empowered, so the young uh, indigenous groups that we were uh, engaging with, they are a force to be reckoned with, like the energy, the empathy, the creativity, uh, as they reclaim their spaces, where it's a, it's, a, it's a place of healing for me to learn that. And of course, um, co-creating safe spaces is absolutely critical. Um, in order to get people mobilized, right? So, but then again, there's a challenge in um, working, collaborating with marginalized communities, and partly because language is <coughs> such a huge barrier. So this year, in COP27, we managed to bring some of the first few indigenous women um, from Peninsula Malaysia to COP, and the first thing that um, they, 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 the barrier that they felt was that they were scared because they don't understand any of uh, English, they don't speak English, they don't understand the technical terms of what climate, they, they, they experienced those lived realities, but they, they felt trapped because they can't contribute to the whole archaic system of COP. <laughs> so um, that's where we, we try to, you know, um, again, uh, build their capacity, co-create spaces with them where they can contribute and keep banging on those doors. So, um, so we invest a lot in a lot of knowledge creation and capacity building because we understand that to keep on, um, keep on demanding for accountability, we need to solidify people's power from the ground. So we are building new narratives, we try to innovate policy making when it comes to climate solutions, decolonizing, using, using the word colonizing is such a taboo in, in my country as well. So we try to decolonize climate advocacy into feminist policies, to dismantle policy directives that are patriarchal, suicidal, and reclaim our means of production into economics, the economics of people where we do not have to fear uh, from one another. So, a lot of our work really relies on the international frameworks that we have to sort of build from the ground and sometimes reinventing the wheel, such as working on gender justice, corporate accountability. So these are really critical um, barriers that we are facing and especially, um, I just wanted to share this story if I may. When we were in COP, um, so we, we were some of the very few people that managed to go to COP. <coughs> so, um, so we bring the collective demands, we brought collective demands from civil society in Malaysia to our national delegation because we didn't manage to meet them in Malaysia. So we tried to ambush them at the, at the, uh, <laughs> at UNF in Shamashe. So we bring in demands from the civil society and the first time we bring in demands from indigenous people from Malaysia. Um, demands for COP27. So when we came in into the consultation with the government, uh, the, the, the meeting with the government and, um, uh, and give the demands and they were like, oh, um, demands is such a strong word, such a crude word. Why don't you use the word request? <coughs> <coughs> 
And so imagine that, that we young people have to crawl <laughs> to go to COP. And then being there, we have to find, you know, funding to finance our accommodation, our food, everything, flight ticket. It costs a bomb to be there in COP. Right, but then again, our government, our uh, national delegation went there on first class ticket, you know, and then living at the most expensive hotels in Shamashe, and yet they asked us to request from them. So it's, um, it was really um, a traumatic experience for me, and of course, the indigenous people who I brought together with me uh, to, to bring these demands. So again, civil societies are not seen as serious stakeholders, you know, and they are not seen as important as business uh, sectors, and therefore we need to continuously demand accountability. So I think that would be my thanks. My thoughts. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. <laughs> it's really important work you're doing. So thank you for that, and. Uh, Ginjali, I think we'd love to bring you in too. I mean, you've you've been one of these change agents. You've been doing a lot of work on environmental protection. Um, how how are you inspired to do that? And you know, what would you kind of tell others who might be thinking about it or need some kind of motivation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, I want to touch on this cop thing really quickly because I've never been to a cop in my entire life. A lot of my friends have. Um, and I've heard some versions of the same story in so many different formats, especially when it's coming from a youth perspective. Um, there was that whole thing that happened, I think it was 25, 26 maybe, mm -hmm. where there were a bunch of kids standing outside these doors like trying to get in, being like, hey, like, we have ideas. Um, I think, for starters, the biggest issue is that we've had 27 of these. <laughs> we've had 27 of these, and mm -hmm. there's been barely anything done. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my take on that. Um, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> on, on your own work on environmental protection and yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, kind of my personal work on the environment as by itself is there's so many different segments to it. My personal research is involved with lead and drinking water, which we were talking about a little bit earlier in your introduction, but. Um, the Flint water crisis is obviously such a huge problem, still is to this day, um, but it's significantly more global now. Um, lead in drinking water has always been an issue, but I think more than that's the whole concept of metals in drinking water. So something that should be a basic human right is now turning into something that's like an option for people. And that's obviously just unacceptable, especially from a place like this where I have clean water to drink and everyone around me has clean water to drink. And so I essentially utilize carbon nanotube sensor technology for an easy way to detect for lead in drinking water. So it is approximately $20 at an R&D phase. It's a patented device. And I'm currently working with a mass manufacturing company to scale and test it in a couple places. We're starting off at Flint, Michigan and moving it forward from there. So yeah, that's some of my work in the environmental sector. However, in addition to that, I run these workshops for students across the globe, a lot of which surrounds this environmental area. Um, a lot of ideas that I get are very, very climate change centered and contamination of our natural resources, which I think is truly one of the biggest problems that our generation is facing right now. Um, the biggest way that I kind of like to empower other students to, I don't like to say do what I do because everyone does things in a very different manner, but the biggest way that I kind of like to put it out there is by sharing with them that their biggest enemy is themselves. And that's how it's always going to be, right? The second you go out there into the workforce, the second you go out there and you try and make like demands, which is the correct word that we should be using, um, people are gonna fight you. Um, and then you're gonna be scared and then you're gonna step back and not do anything about it. Um, especially as a youth, the, the biggest way that I kind of like to combat that is by understanding that all these expectations that we set in this society at this current point in time are going to change. There's going to be no such thing as young people in STEM, no such thing as girls in STEM, and there's going to be no expectations, no stereotypes and barriers that people are setting out there. And that's when we're all going to end up fitting that stereotype, right? And so at the end of the day, the biggest thing to recognize is it's important to take these risks when it doesn't matter versus when it does. And so when all these students that I've worked with, um, I think I've worked with about 71,000 now, which is crazy, um, which means there's 71,000 new budding ideas across the world, whether that's in the areas of 
you know, mental health, climate change, um, resources out there, you know, gender inequality. We're also looking at so many different things that people can make an effort in. And I truly think that, you know, no offense to everyone here, but kids come up with the best ideas. Um, and the reason I say that is because we're not restricted with the box around your head, and we never will be. Because we're growing up in this place in society where we're seeing these problems, we're living with these problems, and we're also coming up with solutions to these problems, whether that's through things that we're saying, things that we're building, or whatever we're doing, right? So I recently had the opportunity to be in New York for the General Assembly. Um, I was part of the, I think it was the Education Summit happening there. But something that you know was a consistent theme that kept being brought up was bring a seat to the table, right? Mm -hmm. Hey kids, bring a seat to the table. And I think, yes, that's incredibly important for any, any kid to bring a seat to the table and be like, hey, I want my voice to be heard. But I think there's no point bringing a seat to the table if that seat isn't taken seriously, right? Yeah. And a lot of times, everyone is put in that situation. And that could be for your age, your race, your gender, your sexuality, whatever, right? There's always going to be something that throws everyone else off in the society around you. And so that's what I tell kids that I work with is, um, you're never alone, even if you think you are, because someone else is facing the exact same thing at this current point in time. So do new things, try new things, build new ideas, um, especially around climate change, because you have the power to change the world, because if I can do it, anyone can do it. Thanks so much. That's super inspiring. Thanks. Yeah. And to turn to a less encouraging topic, <laughs> policy and governance. Yay. <laughs> um, we've, I know we all uh, have a lot to say on that. So perhaps, Nadia, if you could kick us off. Uh, curious to know, I mean, climate change here and across the world has become an extremely polarizing issue. Mm -hmm. um, how do we push leaders towards innovation and action when we are in the situation that we're currently in? I think, um, obviously, with education, and education can enter in, in various different ways, either through community learning, um, in learning on the streets, uh, learning when you're working with communities on the ground and doing community building. So it starts from, um, you know, that, that place where you can learn, right? But what today, there's so many different ways where we can start, but what I wanted to say today in this space is that <clears throat> we need more political leadership from women and young women. So to give you an example, um, in Malaysia, I, I think um, Mary has, <laughs> has spoke a lot about why we need a woman's led, you know, a woman's led movement, a woman's led, whatever it is, but woman's led. Um, so to give you an example, at the moment, Malaysia has just, my country has just um, elected a, a new cabinet so they were sworn in yesterday, and only 17% are women. Like, in Malaysia, we have 50% uh, of population are made from women. Um, so they make up, but then they make up less than, you know, 30% of political participation in our democracy. So that's around 15 million women's needs being put at the back seat while old men again and again continue making decisions on our body, health, education, choice, future, climate, whatever it is. So I think it's really important to put you know, the pedestal into, into uh, political leadership of women at the forefront. I think that's, that's the only thing that I wanted to say <laughs> at the first. It, yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, yeah. Uh, Jono, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think, um, really to, to carry over even on the conversation of bringing a seat to the table on the on the governance side um I, an anecdote uh but i think importantly i think strikes some of the patriarchy that still exists and kind of colonialism that is in governance structures is um we recently um we're only two years old as an organization and i'm very fortunate to a person on my nine person board they felt very strongly if we're a youth organization Empowering Youth Voices for Climate Action. I'm 44 years old. I'm quickly aging out of that demographic. Mm -hmm. That it was really important to have youth voices in full governing positions, not in an advisory council that's kind of a rubber stamp, not one person on the board representing all youth, but really an equal representation on the board. Mm -hmm. And um, I think to echo the points around gender, sexual orientation, really lived experiences that are rich and diverse, really having young people in governance structures 
there are a number of really inspiring initiatives that are really challenging this question that young people can't or shouldn't govern. Mm. And I think really challenging that, I'm very proud of my board of directors for believing in the two young people that are on our board and they have an equal vote and they have an equal voice. Um, and I think that needs to change not only in um, civil society and philanthropic organizations, but really when we think about what space the private sector has is bringing youth into governance positions, I think that can transform the way that we're talking about the issue. And then, you know, the second piece I would say is, you know, on the flip side of that, um, really challenging how funders really view um, how youth, women, black, indigenous people of color really present in terms of governance structures and creating an incentive system for the systems to change the behavior of organizations. What do I mean by that? I think in particular, some of the most uh, progressive organizations that I've seen on the funding side have made sure that there is funding being gone to organizations that represent the change that we want to see. Um, instead of perpetuating many of the systems that have really got us to where we are. So whether it is um, a percentage of youth on a governance structure uh, for the nonprofit space that may be receiving funding or looking at gender and other diverse characteristics on a board, having funders really stay true to funding those organizations that are living the change that we know is necessary. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you, Tanjali. Do you want to run that question by me again? <laughs> yeah, just on the issue of polarization and uh, you know how we push leaders towards wanting to take action and innovation in this area. Yeah, um, I think you know a lot of what I was saying was the bringing a seat to the table thing. But I think another part of that is also bringing things like policy hand in hand with the school curriculum and education. Um, the two tend to be very, very separate and for very valid reasons, obviously. But I think there are specific areas in which they can merge and they should merge. Um, I really like the point that was brought up about um, not having that one kid representing the entire population of children on like a board, right? Especially when it's something that's so incredibly important like climate change and it's affecting our generation <laughs> right here, right now. <laughs> um, but I think that's like a big important part when it comes to me is how we can involve something that the school teaches with something that the government has told us or the government wants to kind of put out there as well. Um, so I think the best way that I like to put it is expanding learning and especially the understanding of human rights issues and you know climate change issues beyond a classroom environment. Like we've talked a lot about inside of a school, we've talked a lot about the curriculum, but now what, right? And that really means creating a foundation so that kids can go out there and do more and want to do more and want and be comfortable with doing more, right? And be comfortable sitting up there and being like, hey, I have a take on this, I have a stance, now listen to me, right? Because it's important. It's important that you know youth find that not only perseverance within themselves, but less of, there's, there's less stigma against I don't know, kids having ideas, because it is it is incredibly important out there. So that that's what I would say, is yeah. um, expanding it beyond a classroom environment, but connecting government policy with what we learn in school as well. Creating a platform, but not necessarily centering an, ex like an entire base of knowledge on that. Yeah, absolutely. And th that's really interesting. I mean, the idea of experiential learning, I think, is something that all of all of you have a lot of, uh, a lot of experience with. Um, Jono, I wanted to ask you about your work with the Red Cross specifically um, and how that informed your understanding of the human rights impacts of climate change. If you tell us a bit about that. Absolutely, I'd spent such a long time within the Red Cross and my husband and I were living in Panama during the pandemic and it was an inflection point for us on what do we do? It was pre-vaccine and trying to determine whether we kind of ride it out and see what happens, but most importantly, after over two decades working within the Red Cross movement and really seeing the uncanny rise of, of disasters, the example that we heard about in Malaysia is really being echoed across the globe. Um, right there in Boulder, um, there's not a year that goes by where there's not some sort of wildfire threat or scare. And growing up in Nebraska 20, 30 years ago, um, yes, there were disasters, but the pace and of course the impact, especially on the most vulnerable, is being felt. Uh, incredibly hard, harder than we've ever seen. And so as a Red Crosser, I remember sitting and thinking about 
you know, what do I want to do with the rest of my career that really makes a difference? And really um, what I was seeing happening in, in particular with the migration remit or migration program that I oversaw within the Americas and the Caribbean, we were seeing thousands of people passing through what's called the Darien Gap, which is the southern part of Panama uh, along the border with Colombia. And most people were of the thought that these were Venezuelans that were fleeing Venezuela. Um, the mass exodus of over 5 million Venezuelans. And the reality is that more than 80% were coming from very distinct parts of the globe across the globe. Uh, Bangladesh, they were coming from places like Syria, um, Sub-Saharan Africa, and working with International Office on Migration, uh, UNHCR, and other partners, it became very clear that those thousands of people that were coming through on a monthly basis from the tip of Panama trying to get to the US for economic security and human rights um, protection, we're largely experiencing the effects of climate change. And there's a great body of literature that looks at this causal change of drought, food insecurity, conflict, and everything in between. Um, and for me, seeing that within the Red Cross um, was really heartbreaking. Um, why I got into the Red Cross in 1994 was this idea that human dignity is a right. Human dignity is inherent in every human across the globe, uh, despite transnational borders and xenophobia. Um, at the base of us all is this right for human dignity. And I was getting concerned as a, an experienced practitioner within the humanitarian and development space that we continue to put band-aids on the problem. You still need humanitarian assistance to alleviate human suffering in the moment but looking at systems fixes. And when I learned about the Climate Initiative's bold goal to educate, empower, and activate 10 million youth by 2025, it really mirrored um, the ethos that I was starting to feel later in my career with Red Cross that really in order for us to uphold human dignity, we've got to find systems fixes. And it's governance, it's policy. And what I was seeing more and more of was really the passion of young people really demanding, and I do agree, I'm an economist by tra uh, training, and we talk about supply and demand, and the word demand is really indicative of systems changes. Uh, the business community can use it, governments can use it. I think uh, it is very apropos for the civil society to really demand these changes um, as a representation of the world in which we know we can create. That's great, thanks. And you mentioned there, of course, Malaysia. Um, Nadia, can you tell us a little bit more about what the status is of, of this push to uh, declare a climate emergency? How far has that gotten? What more needs to be done? Uh, how encouraging? How encouraged are you by the status of it? Right. Um, so the the idea of trying to declare a climate emergency actually happened when um, me and a bunch of my our friends we were uh, actually in a, in a police station. We were in a room. We were about to be interviewed by the <laughs> lawyers, and. Um, one of the lawyers told me, he said that, why are you so angry about the 1.5 degrees? I mean, look at Saudi Arabia, they are living in a 40 degrees you know, world and they're still thriving. And I'm just, this is really bad. Like people don't actually understand the simplest concept and it goes back to the education. And that is, we are facing a, a crisis of education in Malaysia and that's the reason why we are pushing for you know, climate emergency declaration so that we can reform all these different institutional um, practices, laws and regulations and really put the resources where it needs to be right now. So, and then for the past two years, we've been building you know, connections and bridges with, it's the most demanding work. Um, so we, we, we try to co-build coalitions, map baselines, create safe spaces for marginalized communities to lead and thrive in the climate movement in Malaysia. Um, so currently, we, we, um, we have co-founded this coalition called the Malaysian Climate Emergency. Uh, Malaysian Climate Emergency Coalition. So it's right now of around, uh, consists of around 20 to 30 civil societies in Malaysia. And we have consulted with all these organizations um, to uh, reproduce a, um, a declaration uh, of how, uh, a declaration of 12 key recommendations areas of action once a climate emergency is being declared. Because we see everywhere around the world, people, you know, governments have declared climate emergency and then 
quick, quick, nothing happens, right? Like business as usual. So we, we try to imagine, so what happens after the emergency, climate emergency have been declared. So these are key actions all rooted in human rights, rights-based approach, and of course, important science and people lived realities. So um, we named this report um, uh, a love letter to the Malaysian government. So um, I was really happy when we proposed it to our, you know, the old activists, they were like, yeah, that, that's a really good term. Let's use that. So uh, we, we, we pen, <laughs> I would say we pen this uh, 40 pages long of a love letter to the Malaysian government because it's really a declaration of love to the Mother Earth and the declaration of love towards humanity. And, and this is what we want the government to understand, that we, we come from a place with peace and love and let's remain as such. So we, we, we wrote um, the, those kind of declarations and we, we send it to the Malaysian government and it's still being reviewed. We're still doing capacity building with many of our uh, civil society actors. And we have now began publishing uh, climate shadow reports within the human rights um, mechanisms like uh, disaster risk reduction under CEDAW, um, engaging with the UPR and VNR process. Um, sorry, very technical words. Mm -hmm. So these are really important um, spaces to engage with because right now in my country, Malaysia is actually sitting at the Human Rights Council. Um, so UN Human Rights Council and, and despite the fact that they are sitting there, nothing is being done back home. It's such a um, contrasting view. I don't know what's that's happening. And of course, um, at the moment, we are also working um, at the engaging with parliamentary process in pushing for the special select committee on climate, uh, climate crisis. So putting the word climate crisis is really, it's really critical. And of course, um, I think also I just wanted to share this story that um, <clears throat> When I first started doing, doing this work, the word climate justice and climate emergency is never heard of. I mean, it's not something that we socialize in, in Malaysia. And um, I remember that when, we, when I first uh, started working in policy um, a year ago, I tried to put the word climate justice and climate emergency in a policy paper. Uh, this was a review of the National Climate Change Policy in Malaysia. And um, <coughs> one of the lawyers told me, this is not an acceptable word. You know, this is, this is an acceptable term. Is, is this, is this co a correct term? So imagine that. So we've been trying to engage with a lot of media. We've been teaching a lot of young people um, to build their capacity, build their agency to speak out, to speak to media, and then to understand, um, you know, you know, what are the, the risks actually to, to speak to media as well? Because we have seen a lot of, you know, um, violence that comes in from media sometimes. You know, they try to pin you down and say, oh, you're, you're a kid, you're just a university student, you don't know nothing about climate. So we, we try to build in that confidence that, yes, you can speak despite your, you know, your background, and you're not from a science background, you're, you, you haven't really, you know, landed a, a proper job, you're still living in your parents' house. No, no, you, you can speak about climate. And we have been trying to use the word, socializing the word climate justice and climate emergency. So putting, pushing in that, pushing that narrative is absolutely critical. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm cognizant uh, we are running near the end, but we do have a couple of questions that have come in from the app, which I'd like to get to. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just kind of throw this out to the panel, whoever wants to jump in. Um, in what ways can educators, both formal and informal, support young people who want to engage their communities and states in climate action and social justice, but don't know where to begin? Um, I can do a little bit of like, a technology take on this almost. Um, I feel like the biggest thing that I have seen personally, I mean, not in my school, but like in other people's schools that I've kind of like spectated, um, the biggest thing I've seen is just like a fear of technology that's just been so instilled in these students. And I don't think it's a fear of like current technology, but the fear of like the future of technology. And not in the way that like, oh my God, robots are gonna take over the world, but in the way that like, no, like I don't know anything about what's gonna happen in the future because we don't talk about what's gonna happen in the future. 
And if we do, it's just a set of a bunch of really long words. Um, and I, th I like to say that technology without application is just a bunch of really long words. And so the biggest thing that I think from an education, or like an educator standpoint that we could start to do is talk about technology and the future of technology and changes in technology and the applications of technology and normalize it within classrooms, right? Because the way we're going to get over this entirety of a crisis from a scientific standpoint is by utilizing that technology and by looking forward at ways in which you know, we can improve carbon emissions out there and improve ways in which we're using renewable resources. Mm -hmm. And that's done through technology. And so a lot of the work that needs to be done is pushing that onto students and helping them recognize that there's so much going on out there, right? There's no need to fear it and it's not limited to the research and it's not limited to like academia. You don't have to be a PhD to learn what some of the stuff is. You can talk about it. You can explain it to people and even if you don't want to take that first step you can tell people what you think and other people can do that for you um i like to tell a lot of the kids that i work with that um you can't just wait around for someone to solve the world's problems right you're gonna have to take that first step regardless of how small that is regardless of how big that is as long as it's something you're passionate about yeah absolutely um another question from the audience a uh, similar related question in our modern education system, how do we engage children to want to learn about the climate issue? Um, but more specifically, how do we move from a lecture-based curriculum to a more hands-on curriculum that would encourage not only youth, but also teachers to interact more with climate action? Do, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, maybe, maybe I can answer that. Um, I do believe like learning is a lifelong, it's a lifelong process. You don't only learn from classrooms and it has, it's never late. It's never too late to shift. It's never too late to change. And um, I just wanted to say this out loud that um, people always see that you know vulnerable people need protection, but we, we actually don't need protection. We, we don't need sympathies or charity. We need empowerment. We need accountability and we need developed nations to stop to stop colonizing our carbon budget and stop blocking nego nego negotiations and pay up for the fair, fair share. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's really important that you know, teachers you know, truly understand some of these systems of oppression and, and where do they get this information? And, and truly, this is something that, for example, in, in places like in Global South, um, we, don't, we don't have this kind of you know, education. We don't have even a, a simplest information on how to access this information, you, you, you have to seek out. And, and to do that, it takes a lot of your energy. It takes a lot of your life. And, and, and that's where this is actually my point. You know, if you want to, you have to seek out on the place where, you know, you, you are in a, in a, in a healing space, uh, peace and love and don't seek out and don't run things on anger alone because <clears throat> you know when you face so much barriers in getting information uh, it really affects your mental health you know young people have it you know the older activists have it like the old generation have it so for example just coming to this space yeah, I have I've been I've been to several different countries and then um, it's a really tiring process, so please, please take care of your mental health, and, and mental health is absolutely critical. You can't, you know, build your base on power, based on anger, and, 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 and you know, <clears throat> anger alone. So please be ready. Resilience, it starts from, you know, your mental health. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think we have time for one more question uh, from the app. We have... Uh, being asked, as we approach higher and higher levels of public general knowledge of climate-related issues, what do each of you think the next benchmark for knowledge should be? Um, John, did you want to start us off on that one? Yeah, I'd say really building off of this idea of how many educators are, from an education perspective, utilizing climate science or climate communications within the curricula. So one of the stats that I used is that 84% of educators want to teach climate science yet only 43% do. So in terms of like benchmarks and from a data wonk perspective is how do we close that gap? And then likewise, when we look at this cross section with human rights, recognizing that eight out of 10 people recognize that the country or places which they live 
have human right concerns um, broadly, not just in the climate space. So how do we close that gap? And just looking at those two indicators, for me, if I were to answer the question, I'd say, let's stick with those baseline indicators and look at ways to give educators the tools, the agency that they need to feel like they can bring this discussion into a cross curricula across the education system. And then on the human rights side, is let's close that gap so that countries and nation states across the globe feel as if human rights concerns are being addressed, especially through this intersectional lens with climate change. Absolutely. Um, Nadia, did you have any thoughts on the next benchmark? What that I, should didn't, be? I didn't follow the question. Oh, sure, I'll read it again. Uh, so as we approach higher and higher levels of public general knowledge of climate related issues, what do you think the next benchmark for public knowledge should be? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. That is totally fair. <clears throat> I mean, you know, the benchmark um, was such a broad, broad question. I think, um, you know, the, the, the kind of benchmark is that, um, you know, we have to start accepting, um, you know, people's information and information that comes down from the ground is actually some form of knowledge. It's, it's, it's something that we can include in policy making. It's something that we can upscale into solutions and build their yeah, adaptive you know, capacity and such. So it has to start from there. And the more you reject solutions from the ground, the more you reject solutions from local indigenous, uh, you know, indigenous communities, then, then that would be you know, such a lost opportunity. And here we already fit seeing it happening in, in loss and damage where people lose cultures, people lose all those indigenous knowledge. That's something that we haven't even tapped yet. So it's such a loss opportunity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And Ginjali, any final thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, um, and I think to like summarize a little bit of what everyone was saying, the big, I guess, underlying theme is inclusivity, right? And I think that is an incredibly important next step and one that is very, very attainable. Mm -hmm. And um, that means everyone, right? And not just talking about it, but actually doing something about it. Equal representation, um, <clears throat> good representation, I guess. I have seen, I have experienced a lot of, you know, kids being the novelty act, right? Doing speech because we have kids that are involved with our organization and only solely for that reason. And I think a big part of what it needs to be is real perspectives, diverse perspectives brought to the playing field and all taken seriously. And I think that starts with support from big organizations, support from the government, and taking those immediate next steps to take everyone's ideas into account um, and not discarding them, even if they're bad, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think normalizing brainstorming, normalizing failure, normalizing failure from kids, normalizing failure from everyone, that, that's probably, that's like four different steps, but those are the best four different steps. Absolutely, thanks so much. And uh, to end on a, on a very positive note, we just got a very nice message on the app. My name is Emilia Fernandez Rodriguez. I'm 15 years old in Denver, Colorado. I'm a climate advocate and a founding member of a youth-led organization called DPS Students for Climate Action. I just want to let Gitten Jelly know she is so inspiring. And the other panelists have also been so insightful. Thank you. So thank you so much for that message as well. Um, and I also would like to take a moment just to thank our panelists so much. Um, all of you have such uh, insightful experiences to share with us, and it's been a real pleasure talking to you on this topic today. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me.